thank you very much for, for taking the time to join us today um, for an amazing discussion and an incredible panel uh, of experts looking at responsible AI, traceability and uh, accountability in the space. We're going to have a relatively different format than some of the other events you might have attended in, um, in our ecosystem. We're going to allocate around five, million, five minutes for every, um, every presentation for uh, all the experts today. Ashish, uh, Jaris, Ilona, Long, and Charlie. And um, we're, we're going to have um, a couple of minutes after each presentation for questions, try to engage. Um, I know that you would have received a link to Slido to um, you know, add your questions, and I will try my very best to curate it so that the last um, half an hour uh, we can engage in a, a more um, profound conversation around this topic with the experts present today. So we're going to kick it off with um, Ashish from, from, from Microsoft. Um, and hopefully, um, once I stop my presentation, Ashish could, you could, could be um, um, main screen. Um, if you have any question whatsoever, um, add it to Slido. I will keep an eye on it and I will try my very best to um, insert the questions as we go along and most importantly, save it for the half an hour that we have um, towards the end. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Ashish to um, start and um, welcome. Awesome. Hi. Uh, Hello, thank you very much. So should I share my screen now? Yes, yes, please. I have stopped sharing mine. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, do let me know when you see it. A multiple monitor situation going on here. So you know, I just want to make sure that I'm sharing the right one. Uh, all right, so I'm Ashish German. I am uh, uh, the director of tech and operations in customer security and trust organization in Microsoft. I, for last uh, almost two years, I've been focusing on this issue area of deep fakes uh, because we feel uh, that deep fakes is a, a very potent vehicle to spread disinformation. And for creation and uh, detection or countermeasures, uh, there are also ethical implications on of, of deep fakes. Essentially, you have to think about ethics as you're thinking about this technology of AI generated synthetic media. So I'm gonna jump around on this deck because you know this deck is for like half an hour of my presentation, which I don't want to bore you. What I want to do is five minutes, right? So I've given five minutes. I'm gonna jump around. So apologies for that in advance. But so. When we look into, into disinformation itself, right? We, we, we've known this, that misinformation is unintentful sharing information, which uh, is not accurate, versus disinformation is all about intention to harm. And, when, and, and one of the things that we actually realize very quickly is deep fakes, or even cheap, cheap fakes, but then my focus is deep fakes, is AI generated synthetic media to create hyper-realistic digital falsification ha will be a big impact on spreading disinformation. In fact, we haven't seen uh, much uh, of defects uh, yet, uh, but we actually saw some even in the US uh, 2020 elections. Uh, so, so with that, I'm gonna just quickly go through when we think about defects, we actually think about, hey, these are the six kind of defects which can be created. So face swapping, very, very, you know, all of us know, you know, having one face swapped on another face uh, and generating that hyper-realistic audio, oh, sorry, video or image. Lip syncing, where you can render mouth movement and make subjects say things which they will never say or have not said. Puppeteering, you know, you can uh, create all kinds of body movement and, and, and rendering of, of people indulging in the acts that they will never do. So those are the things, but on, especially in the in the US 2020, what we saw was image synthesis, which is 100% artificially generated images. So they were used to uh, impersonate some identities uh, 
uh, uh, to spread this information, like to 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 not only identity, it was a context around that identity which made them authoritative source, all fake, and then help to spread this information. This happens on on all kinds of social media. So this is where where uh, we can. We uh, of the activity. Voice cloning is another set of activity which we saw, which is 100% artificially generated voice, creating a voice font of someone like myself and then generate the whole speech or statements uh, all artificially. We saw some of that as well uh, in the US 2020. Uh, and the text generation, which is another important one, automatically generating text, which is actually a big thing after GPT-3's uh, uh, announcement recently. Uh, but there is a lot of work going on in text generation, and we saw some of the de uh, disinformation uh, technologies using um, uh, text generation as well. Because we don't have much time, I would actually focus on positive, but since we don't have much time, I'll actually jump to the threat modeling directly. Uh, and when we think about deep fakes, you know, we're thinking about and I'm missing one pillar here, which I've recently started thinking about uh, the threat to individuals, which is exploitation, sabotage, harming their reputation. We see a lot of that actually in in, in pornography uh, against women, uh, society, harm to society, uh, social division, especially now in, in the polarized world that we live in. It is very easy to create this false narrative of a community to f have them go against another community. Uh, businesses, uh, we actually are seeing that happen right now, impersonation of leaders and their voices to disrupt businesses. In fact, you know, there are some case studies recently where uh, a, 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 a woman in California was duped by a deep fake of an admiral uh, for for almost three hundred thousand uh, so, dollars, so so that those are some financial fraud facilitating financial fraud using synthetic media deepfakes, and the last, which is my focus, is is what is the impact of disinformation and and deepfakes on democracy? Uh, so distortion, which which actually we are seeing the the pieces of it happening, but we have been seeing it it for last couple of years in in many other countries. Now after the U.S. elections, as we go. Uh, there are some elections happening in Netherlands in the next couple of months and in Germany and others. We see that this may actually, the playbook used in the US may actually be shifted uh, to create uh, uh, harm to democratic principles. The one thing that I want to is threat to journalism, which I will actually, I'm working on it, my thinking right now, and eventually put as, as the fifth pillar uh, of, of my threat modeling. Uh, because I, I, I said I'll, I'll jump around, I'm going to just do this thing, right? So what are the effective responses? So when we think about responses, we think about two things, right? How can we help reduce the exposure of disinformation or deep fakes? Or how can we help to reduce the belief? And those are two different things, right? Uh, because it's a socio-technical problem, you know, it's not solved by technology at all. Uh, one of the things, yes, technology, but you have to think about multi-stakeholder, multimodal solutions to this problem. <clears throat> and then when, when we think about multimodal and, and, and multi-stakeholders, we think in two, two buckets. So can we help reduce exposure to disinformation defects? Can we uh, help reduce belief on that, um, on, on disinformation defects? So multimodal in the sense of you have to if we actually is investing a lot in media literacy making sure that consumers and voters are aware to understand the harms of of synthetic media deep fakes disinformation and have become critical consumers of of information on the web uh, platform policies we are actually working internally in microsoft as well as externally to drive the right kind of advocacy around around platform policies as well as advocacy around regulations because at this point we think that maybe it's meaningful regulations may help and i want to emphasize on meaningful right not broad regulation but you know very specific targeted meaningful regulations and last but not least is technology uh, because this is an ethics uh, conference or at least you know i do want to actually talk uh, close on on ethics of defect uh, you know, intentionally distributing false information is unethical, right? We all should agree on that. Uh, any disinformation or deep fake with an intent to deceive 
intimidate misattribution on inflict arm is unethical as well. Uh, and then the last thing, which I actually do want to call out, one of the things that we are we think is will be used when we think about defects is what we call liar's dividend, where a, a, a rightful a truth actually can be very well discounted that it is a fake. Right. So a, a, a leader or, or a person may do a bad act and then say, no, this is actually because the technology is there. They may say, no, this was my deep fake. Right. So that's another ethical. You have to start thinking about ethical considerations there. Since I only had five minutes, I would actually close out here and open for questions uh, as we go into this panel. Thank you very much, uh, Ashish. I think this is a, a fantastic um, start for our conversation. Um, I think that I'm, I'm going to go uh, on, on technology because I think that the audience is, is mostly formed of entrepreneurs and people that work within the technology space. Um, what do you think is really the responsibility of um, not, not only the, the founders, but in general, those that are building technologies and integrations? Um, and um, are at the sort of forefront of capturing the data and providing the, the best mediums for such content to be distributed. So, you know, I, I think we have to start thinking about what, what we call responsible AI in Microsoft. So we have this Office of Responsible AI. It stood up, I think, five years back. Uh, and, and we have six principles. And, and again, I, I just want to share what we do so that it can at least become some kind of framework or thought process as the founders and the new startups actually come around and start thinking about data, privacy issues, ethics around data collection, data usage, da data analysis, and, 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 and creating applications. Uh, so we have six principles, and I'm I don't want to forget. I do remember them, but I don't want to forget, so I want to actually <laughs> make sure that I, I read them as well. So That's I have perfectly fine. <laughs> fairness, right? So, and again, fairness is important. Accountability, transparency, inclusiveness, reliability and safety, and privacy and security. Those are our six principles. And we can go one at a time, right? So fairness is all about making sure that we are not withholding or allocating opportunities disproportionately, right? So how do we do that? We want to make sure that all our six principles, actually, what we have created is, is harms framework, which is potential risks around the technology and all Microsoft products as they go through their life cycle of software development life cycle, which, which most of the technical uh, folks would know how, how it happens, right, from iteration, from design to deployment. Uh, we want to make sure that responsible AI is the first class citizen. It is not a bolt on. It is not an afterthought. So we have this harms framework and a checklist, and we want to encourage every product manager to start thinking about not only the current harms, but potential harms of that technology. And this committee that we have, responsible AI committee, has a seat at the table from the design phase of the technology. I think we have to do that as a technologist. I'm a technologist, I build products. I've, I, I, I was part of startups back in my career as well. Uh, we have to make sure that, that we are responsibly treating you know, the technology because of the harms that it can create, especially when we talk about data and AI. That, that that is fantastic. Um, we have um, a, a couple of questions coming through. So I, um, in the interest of allocating uh, time for every speaker, I know Ashish, we're going to come to this um, in in the Q and A section. So thank you so much for such an amazing presentation and for your uh, very complete response. We're going to move next, and we're going to have uh, Joris from Volksbank. Joris, if you're able to share your screen. Yes, I'm going to share it. Welcome. Um, I'm very keen to, to hear your presentation. Um, five minutes will start now. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I hope the slides are visible for everyone. Yeah, OK, good. Uh, yeah, I think actually that's a nice uh, bridge from the Microsoft principles to the research I'm doing because I'm interested in operationalizing responsible AI. And I thought it would be nice to start off with what I'm actually doing at Volksbank. 
uh, because I have a position at Volksbank as an ethics officer. Uh, Volksbank is a Dutch bank. It has about three and a half million customers. Um, and we recently created this position uh, of ethics officer uh, to discuss the um, ethics of algorithms within the bank. I work there for one and a half year now, and together with my position at the Volksbank, I started a PhD on AI and ethics. And it's basically a, a project where the two should reinforce each other. Um, so we have this pra practical aspect of operationalizing ethical principles in the context of the bank, and I have this academic work that I'm doing um, on researching how these uh, et ethical principles should be uh, operationalized. Um, so basically, that's the, the two positions I hold, um, and uh, it's not like a 50-50 uh, division between them. Sometimes I'm uh, going all for the academic work, sometimes I'm working more uh, at the bank, so it depends. But the main aim of the project is how can we actually operationalize these high-level and abstract ethical principles in a real and specific artificial intelligence context. And my, my main question there is how can we actually have or get to have these uh, ethical aspects to have practical impact uh, on an organizational level? Uh, because what I found actually when I started at the position one and a half year ago is that um, we have um, a lot of ethical principles. Um, and I believe in 2019, the count was up to 84 uh, frameworks of ethical principles for AI. Um, so there are a lot of ethical principles, most of them converging towards the same sort of principles, but there are a lot of framework, a proliferation of frameworks, you could say. And on the other hand, we have these value sensitive design methods for actually implementing them on a design level. But what was lacking, in my opinion, or underdeveloped, was the uh, gray area between the two, between the abstract principles and the very specific design methods, uh, which is the organizational dimension. Um, ultimately, uh, ethics needs to have a place, needs to be implemented on an organizational level in organizational processes before it can actually have an impact on uh, this organizational level. And I uh, learned this when I started at the bank and I came in and we had a discussion on fairness. And um, most of the data, data scientists will probably recognize this uh, to me coming from an economic psychology and philosophy background. It was new, but I said, we should do something with fairness. What are we doing with fairness? And what I got back was, well, there are actually 21 mathematical definitions of fairness. Which one do you want us to choose for, for example, our credit risk scoring model? And I thought, well, that's interesting. I mean, that's a, a real ethical question. Uh, we all agree that ethics is important. We all agree that fairness is important, that privacy is important. But actually, these trade-offs are uh, where it gets interesting. These trade-offs between, for example, the performance of a model and the explainability of a model, the trade-off between fairness constraints and the performance of a model. And so I got interested in this organizational dimension. How can you make the decision and how can you motivate the decision uh, for a certain type of model given these ethical impacts? Um, and so from an academic perspective, I start, uh, started to study this from a critical theory perspective. Um, and critical theory, I will not tell you the whole history, uh, but it's concerned with the relationship between the structure of technology and uh, human beings. And in critical theory, the author, uh, Andrew Feinberg, uh, has coined the term technical code. And technical code basically describes the background of assumptions, values, definitions, and roles guiding design decisions. And I thought, hey, this is interesting, and this is something I could work with uh, because we have the design methods, we have the principles, but we are insufficiently looking at design contexts. Um, and if we get a grip on the interest that's play in these contexts, we can get a grip on how these trade-offs are made and whether they are made in a way we think is uh, ethically correct. Um, so taking this to a practical level, I started at the bank this, this ethics office and we launched a, a mandatory uh, ethical governance framework for each algorithm being developed in the bank, uh, whether that's AI or not, um, where we actually provide guidance phase of model development uh, uh, up to the deployment of a model and we basically provide ethical advice ethical guidance to the developers and uh, try to get a feel for the ethical implications and the ethical impact a certain algorithm will have and we try to give them uh, advice and guidance on how they should mitigate the possible ethical risks present in their uh, algorithms so that's basically 
uh, where I stand today. So I'm I'm exploring this organizational dimension. I would love to hear uh, your input uh, on that, and I would love to hear how you would operationalize these ethical principles. Um, so uh, yeah, I would say uh, I think I'm still within the five minutes that was given to me. So uh, uh, let's talk and let's have a discussion. I, I think Joris, this this has been an amazing um, amazing presentation. You've touched on so many valuable um, points, and I'm I'm gonna you know I'm gonna ask a question that one of our um, speakers has has mentioned. Um, and then Nikita, if, if you want to say something, then please do. Um, the the role of transparency in a competitive environment obviously you work for Volksbank it's it's a highly competitive you know ecosystem for financial institutions um what do you think the role should be of a access to data and sharing the heart of ai um, in in that sort of scenario can we have transparency and fairness if we hold on to our proprietary technologies or what, what do you think is, is the right approach? Yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, and I mean, uh, I think it also depends on who you want to be transparent to because we have these external oversight agencies and uh, I think they should be able to judge the algorithms that we use and the models we, we develop. Uh, do you also want to be transparent towards your customers? I would say, but that's my personal you do um, maybe more than money banks are about trust and trust is uh, elemental to the financial services and to financial industries as it is elemental to democracy uh, and uh, democratic organizations so i think transparency is a, is a key point there if it's not in your short term uh, for your short term profits then it is for your long term existence because if you do not get the trust and the trustworthiness uh, of your applications from uh, customers or from society or from a societal perspective um, i think you will uh, lose out in the long term. That's a very, very good point. Nikita, you, you, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I wanted to ask a, a brief question to Joris uh, in light of transparency again, uh, given we're, we're building this open transparency framework. Um, the question is, uh, you said that you have this internal supervisory board and you oversee all algorithms and models that you build uh, in the bank. Uh, the question is, how do you make sure that the ethics that you have in your bank coincides or, or is collinear uh, and the same as of your customers? So how do you make sure that these two uh, sets of values align? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, and the honest answer is, uh, we still have to find that out. We started, uh, but we now have a mandatory structure for developers, and we do want to have some form of a, an external panel, so to speak, or ex external representation, um, which can actually help us uh, get a feel for the values that are uh, in society and how uh, people in society, for example, consumers would evaluate our decisions. Um, but I think the first step for us, and I think for every organization out there, is actually get a grip on the ethical aspects of algorithm development, signaling uh, and letting uh, algorithm developers signal uh, when their algorithms and how their algorithms will have an ethical or a moral impact, and then uh, taking the responsibility of uh, documenting that uh, is, is a first step actually in starting to evaluate those decisions and starting to evaluate um, um, the the ethical aspects of an, of an algorithm. So we started, uh, I hate the word, but we started in an agile way uh, in just uh, getting to get started and learning about how um, how the ethics could be implemented in not just a specific use case or a discussion you have on a specific use case, but really on an organizational process level. And we need to expand and we need to extend this approach. And I'm, I agree with you that we have to check with other stakeholders whether we're on the right track. But I think, and maybe I should, should mention this as well, uh, the Volksbank is a state-owned bank in the Netherlands. Um, so it has uh, sort of the duty to be, uh, I literally translated, it means the people's bank. It has the duty to be in touch with uh, and values. But I think the first step um, of this ethical process is to actually uh, get a grip and start documenting the decisions you make uh, on specific algorithms and models um, and motivating these decisions. So whether, uh, how, however it turns out, you can always say, look, we... Uh, 
these aspects. We looked at transparency, we looked at how explainable the model is, uh, we looked at the impact it could have, and based on all that information, we decided this. And maybe it's the wrong choice, and then we should take responsibility for that, but at least we have a starting point to build uh, what we call Morris prudence. Uh, so you have jurisprudence, which is, of course, of all uh, legal decisions being made. And Morris prudence is all the moral decisions we made when it comes to our, our algorithms. So we're building that uh, now. Thank you very much, Joris. This, this is You're uh, welcome. an amazing um, you know, presentation and, and answer. I know that we're going to have more to, to touch on um, in the half an hour saved for uh, questions and the questions are kind of um, gathering. Um, please do use the facility to, to ask away. I'm going to ask Ilona to share your presentation and potentially you know, provide a, an introduction to yourself and to the topic. Sure. Ilona, are you with us? Yeah, I yes. am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Can you share my, can you see my screen or have you given me permission? You should be able to share it. There's nobody here. Um, I'm trying to share, but I don't see the button here. Uh, it uh, says share. open share tray. Yep, yep. There we go. It changed on the screen here. Okay, click the button to share. So while um, I'm doing this, uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I am Alona Cody. I am a past president of Arma International, which is the uh, leading organization um, for uh, records and information management uh, within uh, probably globally. There's other groups too, but uh, I'm former UN and uh, I've been doing this goodness for 25 some odd years. I'm also uh, in my final year of completing my uh, PhD in cybersecurity, uh, so I've, like I said, I've, I've been extensively working on this area for for quite some time. But a lot of the conversation that we have, right, and how do we do this? Even if you're creating algorithms or doing things, it comes down to essentially you're creating records. Now, I thought that I originally had ten minutes, but I have five, so we're going to skip through this uh, pretty quickly today. But understanding, you know, what is a record, right? We don't always use the term record anymore, right? You'll hear data, information, content, and so forth. But technically, uh, you know, I've just defined record as a notation that a transaction has occurred. And this is really important because sometimes you'll remember the term like non-records or official record, but a judge in the age of, you know, e-discovery and forensics honestly isn't going to care whether or not you checked a box and declared a record. So this is something that's just really important. And typically records, you know, you may think of like boxes and off-site storage, but uh, you have electronic records as well. And when you manage these together, it's known as uh, hybrid records management, typically. I've been teaching the uh, electronic records course at the University of Dundee in Scotland now for almost 10 years. So uh, I, I cover this <laughs> on a regular basis um, frequently as well, in addition to being a practitioner. But uh, metadata is also really key here, and as well as taxonomies. So when you think of hybrid record keeping systems, you have this but like I said without the record keeping you wouldn't know if you've been compliant you know with the ethics in some cases now some of you may have seen this right I know that we have a lot of you know engineers uh, on the call uh, but in this case you can see right and, and this goes on you, you may also refer to some of this as like a data map right so if that's a more familiar term to you fine uh, but we go into inventories and just keeping track of, of records as well and there are some best practices especially if you have a lot of PII within your organization right uh, you should be doing this because the fines are really high but one of the things that I realized too especially in my research and when I was doing privacy by design it was the fact that uh, it's not the fact that right the engineers didn't want to do privacy by design. It's that a lot of us, we didn't train you guys on how to do this or what, you know, the privacy requirements were or the laws, right? So when we said, oh, do PBD, you know, the light bulb finally went off, right? And doing my research was that, hey, we never told you what this was. And the same concept applies to even like records management basics. Right. So so if you're there and you're like, well, I don't understand what retention there is or how to apply it, that's not your fault because 
you probably haven't gone through the training. But typically, there's over you know 50,000 retention laws in the U.S. alone, and several hundred thousand regularly in globally. So, and they change on a daily basis, and that's one of the things and components as well. But that's why it's up to records managers and other professionals in the organization to make sure that they stay up to date on it and that you can apply it. But over retention, as I mentioned, has you know very serious consequences because the litigation and the fines and they can be you know in the millions of dollars as well as reputational damage. But one of the things that I also say too is you need to be the master of your data universe. Right. And with that, you have to start shrinking your universe to only maintain and manage what's relevant. So if you have all of these extensive security protocols and parameters in place, great. But why are you maintaining data that you didn't need to in the first place? Because that would make it more secure. And let alone with PII, if you're over retaining data, you shouldn't. You could also be fined for that. So here's just, you know, a screenshot of just how much data there is. There's almost three like zettabytes of data in, in the world, right? This grows on a regular basis. Uh, you can see here with the fines of about 10 million some odd euros, uh, the data breach, and this is from the Ponymon Institute here, on average, it's about 3.86 million, right? So whenever there's something there, the litigation can be very, very expensive when you're almost, it's definitely in millions of dollars. And then you go into healthcare with this uh, as well. And then hacking is really important, right? So one of the things, too, that I found was you had from the ITFs, the IT frameworks, in a lot of cases, especially when you look at like NIST and some of the risk management, you'll see a lot of them have identify, which is what that inventory is about for your records. But in my opinion, I don't think you can do either privacy or security well without knowing what data you have on hand, who has access to that content, and where that data is stored. So as you can see here, NISTA didn't have that, and they went to classify, right? Because without identifying, it's really hard to classify first. Classification can be a secondary step. Uh, IAPP, which is the International Association of Privacy Professionals, they did this, and they did more um, frameworks as well. So I think it's really important to try to integrate that. Uh, also, start thinking of information as a liability, right? Especially, and you know, that's why we have cyber insurance. So information can also be an asset and add value, but at the same point in time, you need to really start quantifying the levels of risk in your organizations. And if any of you are going through mergers and acquisitions, I always say don't acquire dirty data because then that goes into also, you know, the ethics and compliance issues as well. In some cases, if you can avoid that because you didn't do it in the first place, definitely try to do that. Um, the other point, I know I'm about to go over here, but uh, if you, it's about decision rights. And a lot of times in the past, records managers weren't given those decision rights, but I think it's because we didn't explain to IT properly what we were trying to do. It's not like we tried to infringe. We just didn't explain, hey, there's a bunch of these laws and regulations that you have to really adhere to. But if you start automating a lot of these processes, you can really enforce and automate decision rights as well too. So we we always say, you know, there's really no artificial in AI, right? You still need manual intervention and system training in addition to the people training for now. But that's okay. You know, you can get there. It does take a little bit of time. But also if you think of retention schedules as policies, I think that will also help as well because policy management and then this is just a listing of, uh, you know, who may have roles in the organization as well. Uh, and just some insights, as I said, you know, if you have uh, the information here and it's digital, it's a lot easier to manage in some cases. On the other hand, if you're in litigation, it's a lot easier to find, right? So that's one of the things. Um, remember, right, tactical versus strategic too, right? Before all these data breaches and everything, you could have thought the auditors and the cybersecurity people were interfering, but now try to work with them a little bit more too, because we're really here to protect the organization. And then just, you know, some next steps on screen here that you can see. But otherwise, think of multiple tiers of potentially implementing retention, purge records, but keep logs, right? Um, build purge mechanisms into your software code during the SDLC, or at least as early as possible in the beginning, use metadata, automate as much as you can, and train staff. And then one of the things, too, that I always say is, you know, sometimes this, these systems can be expensive, but just get started. You know, even if it's manual on a shared drive or if you're just developing policies, just go ahead and, and start doing it. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ilona. I, I I think one of the you know going from your retention laws and of course the liability of having dirty data or exposing yourself to uh, data hacking and and therefore um, having a system that is regulated through the courts. I I guess what I'm really interesting given your um, you know so many years working with governments and international institutions. How are government, how is government regulation looking at and, regu and, and implementing new rules for ethical aspects of AI? And what are you seeing? Um, because clearly this is about record uh, maintenance. It's about, you know, private litigation in vast majority of cases. But what is the government um, in, in doing in this respect? Do we have any sort of um, framework that this can be built on? So I think that California is leading this here with the CCPA, which is the California Consumer um, Privacy Act, which uh, is putting mechanisms into place to really enhance, you know, what data especially is collected about individuals. Now, other states are following this where, for example, with like biometrics collection, I know New York has several uh, rules that they're trying to put into place, but CCPA uh, will be enacted here shortly. I, I, with the government now, some of those are being adopted as well. But you know, unfortunately, with the U.S., we're not quite as uh, as the EU or Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and many other countries. Right? They um, they just don't think of it. Uh, in the past, uh, personal data has been collected, like in Florida, for example, and sold, you know, from driver's license information. And that was about $75 million several years ago. So they see PII as being, you know, revenue generating. So I think that, you know, the government does have to do more enactments, but I think it's at the state level as well. And, you know, again, it's one thing to write a policy, but it's another to enforce it. And that's why you know, if there's something with automation or tracking or, you know, a system that can check if if uh, code is up to par with what privacy requirements there are. But personally, I think the U.S. has a long way to go. That's that's um, an important point. No, I agree with you that CCPS is an important piece of legislation coming. Um, and thank you so much for, for your presentation. There are so many questions that um, some of the attendees are uh, already, um, you know, it's, 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 trust me, it's, it's a very important list. I, I'm mindful of time. And I think that naturally we're um, the next speaker, uh, Long Tham from all four EU, um, is going to continue exactly on this line, looking at how um, governments are intervening here in, in, in Europe. So Long, are you still with us? I am here. Hi. Um, can I please ask you to share your screen? Okay. Um, Ilona, if you could um, potentially stop sharing. Yeah, that's perfect. Long, have you been able to to share? Ilona, it's Hi. a little bit on the right. So you're, uh, there is a button with a cross on the on the screen close to the lead button. For sure. Okay, I got it. Yeah, perfect. Good. Thank you. Okay, now I can share. Fabulous. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay. All right. So well, right. while you're trying to um, share your presentation, I will ask uh, everyone still with us. Please do add your questions. I'm seeing everything that comes comes through, and I'll. Um, find the right way to engage with a panel in the half an hour we have allocated. So please do uh, write your questions. There are some that are so amazing. Um, I can't wait to, to have an opportunity to, to put them forward. Are you able? Hello, I'm back. Yep. Sorry. Can I you share? I think I can share.
Can you see it now? No. Okay, just hang on. Always having um, technical challenges. Okay, yeah. Can you see it now? It's coming through. Yes, yes, I can see it. Okay. It's all good. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Over to you. Sorry for uh, the um, technical hiccup. Okay. No so um, <laughs> uh, I am with the AI for EU, as you see on the screen. Uh, so it is a platform. Uh, for AI on demand, and uh, it is supported by the European um, Union. Uh, and uh, we are a Horizon 2020 project uh, worth uh, 20 million. Uh, it's a lot of money. So uh, basically that we are trying to mobilize the entire uh, European AI community to make AI uh, real uh, in our society as well as in the economy. And we are trying to get that in a collaborative uh, AI uh, European platform, which is we already have uh, physical platforms that are available. Um, online and uh, after this I encourage all of the uh, participants to actually check us out and uh, see if you want to be a uh, member on that and we also have later on you will see a lot of things to offer to you but today's topic is actually on the um, the, the ethical uh, part where as you see here is our project is focusing on five uh, research area which is just only one part of what we are trying to do and here you would see about the um, the very uh, verifiable AI explainable AI and as well as um, the physical AI and uh, all of those are actually um, surrounding the human centers uh, AIs that we are driving towards and those are actually being done through the six, uh, the eight pilots experiments that we have in all of those areas that I'm not going to go into in details. But as you know, that we are trying to uh, um, explore all of the ethical aspect in those uh, application areas uh, that we are uh, trying and bring it onto the platform as an example, as well as the learning lessons that we can share with uh, our community on that. And um, we have around 81 uh, members and uh, we also um, have um, companies that are joining us uh, from um, large company to SME. And also we have um, social um, organization, just like the um, the organization uh, open ethics that uh, you are driving toward. And again, we also have the 3 million cascade funding available for those SMEs and startup. And if any of you are here interested, uh, we would uh, highly recommend you to come up and um, check out uh, the available resources for you and uh, as you see here i just an, another way of looking into it uh, what we are uh, comprising of but we are not just only all those um, communities that you are seeing here we are more than that and here is the snapshot of those um, work packages that we are having but as you see here uh, on the left is the work package five which is what uh, is actually I would like to focus more on in this presentation. So which is the uh, promoting European ethical, uh, legal, cultural and social economic values. And those are actually being done through the um, well, package seven, where we identify the technological gaps, where we also done through the um, technological transfer activity which is actually the 3 million cascade funding for SME to actually doing those uh, applications and developing those uh, applications. And also from the ecosystem development as well as from the pilots that we are running. So we are learning about those and we are sharing those learning in ethical uh, and trustworthy of AI uh, using all the principles, as you know, from the, the guidelines that um, 
issued by the uh, the um, the European Commission. And by the way, by in twenty twenty one next year, we will see actually a legal framework going to come forward based on those. So I think that um, we would have a lot to ramp up to that and learning to share there. And here is just another way of looking into that. And you see that what we are trying to get out of. And all of these will be able to share with you on our platform. And um, we, as, a, as you see here, how we position ourselves is actually that we are a platform that we're trying to enable, to empower, and to um, help all of those uh, different uh, um, institutions, uh, as well as initiative in Europe, as well as projects and also different stakeholders that um, already out there and concerning about AI and and um, and every other aspect of AI. We are not going to answer to or going into very deep level of every single part, but we are what we are trying to do is that it's like electric city. Um, as you already know, they talk a lot about AI with the uh, similar to the invention of electricity. So it, it has a different um, aspect from the demand size to, uh, to, to the supply size. And it has a lot of issues that need to be addressed. And one of those, as we are talking about today, is ethical. Uh, and uh, those would be based on the trustworthy AIs that we have, um, you know, ability to to do that and help our um, what we call uh, ecosystem to to do that as well so we are having this uh, here um, as the ecosystem um, you can learn more about this and uh, as you see here uh, your organization here and all of your community would fall into those um, uh, eventually or uh, if and then we also wanted to, to let you know that we have the resources available for you uh, in terms of the knowledge, also in terms of the um, resources that, uh, and also uh, financial resources that available through our open course that we would soon uh, launch. And uh, I would like all of you to, um, if you can take a snapshot of this one and you can check it out, it is the, um, the ethic topics on our platform at the moment and we have the observatory right here and just today we have the whole day um, uh, workshops on the trustworthy AI made in Europe from uh, principles to practices so we have quite a bit of that uh, we will be able to share with you and we also have the experiment part of the platform that you if you have any algorithm you want to test you want to kind of doing some experiment we would welcome you and we would welcome you to check them out and if you do have any question come back to me let me know how I can help you with and we also have the AI resources as you see here we have the local rule-based explanation, which is explainable AI would be something challenging at the moment, but we are starting to crack down on those. So I'm not going to go uh, any further. I am working for um, University College Cork, uh, where we have the Insight Center for Data Analysis, and we actually have the assessment list for trustworthy AI. Uh, that is actually we work with the, um, the, the AI Alliance from the uh, European Commissions to do that. And I highly recommend you to check it out. And there's uh, seven um, major points uh, rather than six from Microsoft, as you see earlier, so that you can actually see that how you could actually develop that and familiar yourself with that before it become a legal framework and you don't have to kind of um, go into any um, litigation process later on hopefully uh, but we are learning together and that's what we are here uh, for and uh, that's it for me I'm sorry I run through a few minutes but I hope that is okay no worries well long I, I think that that was an, a, um, a you know quite an insightful presentation and I, I have um, a question in two parts. Um, there have been some AI related uh, resolution packages introduced uh, this year and 
you know, one of the, the first question is, do you think that that is an adequate response for our ecosystem where we are now and where we're heading? Um, and the second, the second part of the question is, what are the steps that a, a company um, has to take to ensure that they are building responsible AI? Uh, and I know we're going to delve into more, um, you know, more on this um, in the Q and A. But I think that this this is your um, your specialty, so it would be really great to understand what you're thinking. Um, sure, I uh, for I need to clarify something here. I am even though that in policy. Um, policy analysis as uh, what I studied before. Uh, AI has been uh, my uh, home for the past uh, 18 months or so um, since I joined the AI for EU project as the community managers for the project. And what I see uh, from uh, last year when we was actually having the first, uh, the second conference no, the first conference, so this year is the second one, on the, the AI Alliance organized by, by the European Commission, we already see quite a bit of um, recommendations and the, the kind of the active participation of all different um, stakeholders that uh, are actually in. And the response uh, from... European Commission in terms of the um, in terms of the the uh, paving the way toward the legal framework is actually already have the white papers that was actually um, issued um, earlier and get um, more than a thousand response from uh, companies from organizations from um, ordinary people on uh, whatever that they are concerning about in AI so I think that um, gradually, we would see that, and along that side, you see from Microsoft, you see from any other uh, industry, they are also aligned together. Siemens, which is one of our stakeholders as well, they are mobilizing the the um, the resources, the research base to really addressing those trustworthy AI. Are we there? I don't think we are there um, because. That's why the the um, last month the European Commission actually launched a new uh, way of pursuing with AI is actually that building ecosystem of trust and ecosystem of knowledge. The knowledge is actually based on the excellence in science, um, in technologies, in skills, and also. Um, in in the basic of, of the um, AI is which is data. If you don't have the reliable data, good quality data, you are not going to be able to to have the the qualities um, AI or, or uh, trustworthy AI. So I think that we are not there, but we are working toward there. And there's a quite a bit of uh, initiative as well as um, a resource already um, kind of uh, on the way and in the pipeline uh, to address that. Thank you very much, Long. I really appreciate your, your detailed response. Um, we're reaching the final um, speaker today. Charlie, can I ask you to share your screen? Sure. Let me... Yes, uh... yes sure. Hi, Charlie. Hi. Let me just try and... Has that gone up? Yes. Yes, it has. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to leave you to um, uh, present your your part, and uh, then how, we'll swing straight into the Q&A. How long have I got? <laughs> um, I think five, ten minutes, it should be five. perfect. I'll, fine. I'll, 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 we're I'll, just going to continue. Okay, I'll try and keep it short. So I, I'm gonna, there's been quite a lot of talk uh, on this session about tr uh, transparency one way or another, and that's great to hear. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about transparency um, and I guess what I'm going to do here is offer more of a kind of outside in perspective. Joris particularly talked to, I think from an inside out perspective uh, and it was really good to hear actually about how governance you know is actually operating within organizations and that's really really important. However um, uh, you know so maybe a disclaimer first off you know I'm no AI expert 
Um, I'm not a coder or anything like that, uh, but uh, my background is in politics uh, and in communications and uh, latterly in crisis management. Um, so, so I'm going to come at this from a kind of outside in perspective um, and, and have a look a little bit at, you know, what people think about AI um, and, uh, and, then, and then just quickly lay out some sort of overarching principles and practices um, which can help build trust. Um, so that leads into this whole area of trustworthy AI. There, there's a lot of jargon in this area is one thing I'm finding out. Um, so, you know, in terms of, sort of top line perceptions, you know, there are very contrasting views out there about AI. However, one thing that's pretty true is that, you know, whilst awareness amongst the general public is high, understanding of it is low. Um, and Partly as a result of that, there are widespread concerns about issues like privacy, cyber, uh, manipulation. Um, uh, Ashish was talking about deep fakes, that's part of mis and, disinf mis and disinformation, you know, equality and human rights, and, and, and also unemployment or, you know, impact certainly on employment. Um, now, you know, why is trust low? Well, there are all sorts of reasons. Here are a few. Um, first of all, clearly, you know, sister AI systems tend to be pretty opaque. Uh, you can't see them, you don't know how they work, um, and you don't really know why you're being delivered the results that you are. Um, there's very little understanding of the functionality, um, the competence, risks, and limitations of AI. Uh, and that's true not just for the general public, but also technology journalists. You know, most technology journalists do not understand AI. That's very clear. And they're not, and, and they're not allowed to test the, um, the, uh, or actually have a look at the code. So, um, you know, uh, there's all, you know, even people who are meant to be closely involved in the industry don't really have much view of this. Um, we also see a lot of sensationalist and sort of alarmist uh, media coverage around things like unemployment, surveillance, uh, killer robots, and so on. You know, and all of this leads to low trust um, that is shot through with myths and misconceptions. Um, and, um, you know, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of um, AI uh, uh, programs or products and services, if you want to call them that, that are misfiring. Um, and here are one or two. In here in the UK, we've had a, a very high-profile example recently um, around uh, student exam grading, which uh, badly big backfired on the uh, on the government. So. You know, the, there's a changing landscape, and I think the general shift, and I won't read through all of these, but the general shift is towards um, greater accountability uh, and and transparency. Uh, and in my view, that's that's a very good thing. Um, um, and, and indeed, you know, some components of what you might term trustworthy AI are starting to emerge. I think you know there is a there is a greater emphasis on governance and ethics. Um, and and that's great, you know, that helps, um, um, you know, in, in, increase some sense of accountability um, and uh, and it may and things like traceability and explainability help systems help make systems safer and fairer, um, as well as, you know, organizations and engineers and experts actually understand the decision making of AI. However, uh, from the outside in perspective, you know, from the consumer, the general public perspective, algorithms remain, or AI-driven uh, algorithms at least, remain fundamentally opaque and confusing. Um, and and perceived accountability of organizations, um, you know, and you might think of Facebook in this regard, remains very low. Um, so, you know, what, what might be some principles of AI transparency? Um, and, you know, you know, I come at this for chiefly from a, a reputational and communications perspective, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so I, I'm not going to talk so much about the governance aspects. Nonetheless, governance is critical. It's core to transparency. So, you know, putting values, ethics and transparency at the center of AI governance, I think, is very, very important. 
involving directly impacted impacted stakeholders in AI design and testing. I mean, if the British government had decided to that they wanted actually to involve students in its exam grade algorithm, I think they would have come out with a very different solution. Monitoring and, and strengthening AI governance and, te and technology continuously, you know, making sure that you're always improving and that you're responding to both internal and external um, uh, pressures. Um, communicating clearly, honestly, consistently and regularly right from the start uh, is, I think, it's a, you know, communication, good communication is a fundamental tenet of, tra of transparency. And being able to think laterally about unexpected consequences, again, not just from a technological perspective, but also from a societal, cultural and values based uh, uh, perspective. Um, so what does AI transparency mean in practice? Well, you know, it, 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 on the communication side, and again, I'm not going to talk about governance per se or ethics per se here, but you know, the governor, if you know, what is going on in the governance area needs to be communicated. Um, and I think giving insight into the processes and strategy and the people involved, um, as well as you know perhaps open, open sourcing data sets and toolkits and so on is is, is 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 very important. Equally, of course, around the actual product or service or system, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know what is this thing trying to do? What are its objectives? In what context is it being run? Um, you know, some information about technology itself, data processing, you know, what are the outcomes? Can they be improved somehow? Um, as well as, of course, around some of the risks, notably around sort of, excuse me, human oversight, uh, 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 I, I think it's very, and privacy is very important. And then finally, you know, around incident crisis management. I mean, what happens when, if, and when these things backfire? So uh, preparing for that, uh, learning and understanding how to respond appropriately um, rather than just shutting up um, or pulling the algorithm, um, uh, you know, how do you recover uh, properly and making sure, you know, linking to recovery that you're learning and acting up and being seen to act upon the lessons learned. Um, there are, of course, dangers around AI transparency. Uh, there could be potential loss of IP. There could be potential loss of competitive advantage. Um, uh, you know, you're you're trying to create higher expectations amongst your various stakeholders, but you fail to meet those. That could be a problem, and then, of course, there's reputational damage. So, you know. Transparency is not a one-way street. It has two sides, and you've got to find the right kind of balance here. But I think these are the kinds of things that I argue. You know, I see, I see communication as a kind of layer. It's it's critical. It's a core part of what you might call ethical AI. But it's also a layer over it, um, as I see it. And um, and you and you need to try and try and um, find ways of connecting, persuading and engaging and ideally involving audiences, because of course, involving people in something is the best communication of all. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Charlie. I I think that we've received quite a record number of, of questions and just looking at the time, we're probably not gonna be able to delve into them. So while you were presenting, I thought of a way of kind of tackling them by themes. Um, and the best approach that I, I think we should take is, first of all, let's look who is responsible, who's actually building. There are a few questions in this respect. Um, then about the data, then around that, the enterprise and applying those principles. And I know Joris and uh, Ashish will have quite a lot to say as well. And we're going to come back to ethical controls and, and, you know, do we have real problems that warrant AI and how do we actually do it? So. I'm going to start with um, two questions that uh, have, have come through and they're, I think, very important um, and they tie up together. What is the responsibility that um, is shared by those, uh, you know, developers of machine learning modules? And um, what does hiring, what, the, what role does hiring from a diverse and inclusive background 
play um, in, especially when you're building AI, um, especially when we have inherent biases that we have to deal with. So is diversity and inclusion the solution to ensure that whenever we're building um, and who actually builds the modules, um, is that a, a defend the defensibility system that we can put in place? If I can, um, you know, ask any of the speakers to unmute yourself and ask, ask, you know, answer the question, that would be really great. I can, I can just, just add my, my thoughts there is, is absolutely, right, absolutely yeah. diversity. So again, we go back into this whole principle of, you know, there will be argument and there is argument that, hey, uh, technology is technology, it doesn't have bias, right? But that is a flawed argument, right? It is a flawed argument because at the end of the day, technology is created by humans and all of us have biases, right? Uh, we, you know, we have these, these implicit biases that uh, those are just our survival mechanism. It's it's like it has it has it is genetic, right? At the end of the day. So what do we do to actually make sure that not only we are aware of those biases, but we are actually working against them? And diversity and inclusion actually is the biggest solution there, which is you know bringing alternate viewpoints, right? So I can tell you this, right? You know, if you have uh, a lot of male sit around create a technology which is working for women, you know, obviously we have not the capacity and capability to think that point of view, right? So you have to include all of us together to build a solution. And that's where I think your point is diversity and inclusion from my perspective and from Microsoft perspective is I think the best any antidote to this whole problem of uh, bias in technology. Do do you think Ashish that you know the uh, you know hiring of um, ethnic minorities blacks it has a is an important you know how is it tackled in our industry? Well, so so you know, I'll say yes. It is it is very very important, right? For from the basic principle of that, hey, you know, all kind of point of views are important as you start building the next generation of technology. But to your point. Uh, it is the right thing to do, not just from a technology perspective, but also making sure that, and at the end of the day, and this is the reason, right, which is I think very, very strongly about is your consumers are not one set of customers. Your consumers are diverse, your customers are diverse. So the builders of the technology have to be diverse as well. So, so it is not just the right thing to do, it is also the business imperative to do it right so 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 yes it is that's how we should build and there have been problems we are not there yet but i think we are making steps in the right direction the quickly we reach there the better we will be in a position to solve these problems no that's that that's a very that's a very good point i i know that we we don't have um you know, sufficient time to delve very deeply into, into this. I think it warrants actually Nikita a completely different session to discuss it. It's it's so imperative to, to just do that um, and, and to have an understanding of um, biases, diversity, inclusion, and, and what is the real impact of technology. Now, um, I'm going to swing to um, the issues around data and how do we actually control this process. And one of the questions was around if we're capturing data from users without permissions, um, is that an unethical um, scenario? Um, how do we approach that? I, I have some thoughts here. If yeah, go for it. You know. so, so again, it, it depends on obviously the, your country or your jurisdiction for one, if it's illegal or not, depending on what part of the world you're in. It's not necessarily illegal. Is it ethically wrong? No, but there was a, a study, I believe by MIT several years ago, which said that I don't necessarily need information, you know, your name or identifying information. I can just capture other things. And then there's what's known as the data aggregates. So a lot of advertisers will take different data points. Uh, it could be an IP address. It could be a geolocation, uh, even like preferences or email addresses or things like that. And then you lump those into 
space. So I obviously I think this is how a lot of the you know larger social media platforms uh, make their money, right? Is gathering and aggregating that data from us. But in some cases too, there is now what's known as aggregate data in general. So if I have several points from you, I can generate new information that you may not even know of, or what you know certain traits are, and capture that type of information as well. So again, not illegal yet uh, in some cases, but this is what the disclosure comes to is, and, and at that same point, do you give up trade secrets and what you are collecting about people and how you do that? And then certainly how you use and you disseminate that information to uh, especially third parties. That, that is, that is a, you know, a very good point. Then, um, you know, the next question is, and uh, again, we're coming back to kind of the production of uh, and bringing technology to market. How can we ensure, especially around deep fakes, how do we identify, track, and um, you know manage deep deep fake? What tools do do companies have right now in the ecosystems, especially um, startups, especially um, you know very young companies looking to bring new products to the market? Uh, so, when we think about technology solutions, right, we think about short term right now and long term, you know, that eventually I think is the right way to tackle these. Short term detection of defects uh, may help. Now, detection is super hard, right? You know, even the Facebook detection challenge, the best algorithms were able to get 65% of accuracy. Uh, so, even the detection is too hard, it is a cat and mouse game. Uh, but we have to keep on thinking about that, right? And and then it can come into various forms. And I've I've actually written a bit about this on on in in, in a couple of blog posts. On a long term, as you think about the right solution to misinformation, disinformation, or even deep fakes, is authoritative source behind that piece of medium. So authentication and provenance. Can you prove? that this piece of media is coming from an authoritative source and has not been tempered with when it goes to the distribution endpoint. So YouTube player or Facebook player or whoever, right? Uh, and 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 what what it and also you can you prove the origins of this media, right? Where it is coming from, authoritative source, non-authoritative source, and has not been tempered. So the technology which we actually trying to get to is something which we think akin to what SSL is, right? All of us know that padlock, the secured socket layer technology, which is certificate based. And, you know, we know that end to end encryption happens between browser. And if we have something of similar technology where a piece of media can be somehow have a signal that can flow across that piece of media as it is going through this pipeline of compression, decompression and, 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 and whatnot. An endpoint can say, okay, I know because this has the signal. Now, I don't know what the signal look, will look like eventually, but there is some work that Microsoft is doing, Adobe is doing, uh, even Google is, is working on uh, with what we call uh, what we call project origin. Adobe is calling content uh, uh, authenticity initiative. Google has uh, content ID, but the concept is the same where you have an authentication and provenance mechanism in piece of media. That is that is a very very good point, um, Joris. There are some questions for for you, and um, but I, I just first first things first. Um, we had two questions uh, around diversity. One from was from women. One was from on blacks. And I'm just going to come out there and say it, it wasn't intended. I have added the element um, and I haven't tried to distort the meaning, the meaning of the question. It's um, on, honestly, it was my intention to ask this and to potentially um, open the discussion in a, in a way and potentially even cover it in a whole event. I think it's, it's, um, it's very important to, to have that frank approach. Okay, Joris, um, the point that uh, there are several questions, so I'm going to start with the first one. 
Um, many, many people have had questions around the examples of introducing fairness into algorithms and products. And most importantly, how do you select the different principles that you are, um, um, you are uh, you are introducing into your framework because uh, when you're building technologies, picking the right principle or specific principles um, can have a completely different um, impact. So how, you know, how are you approaching this in your organization? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question, and I think that's a challenge uh, every organization is uh, is facing. How can we uh, motivate the principles we pick and the decisions we make in interpreting these principles? Because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the principles are fine, and no one is against uh, world peace. We all want them to be fair, and we all want them uh, to be explainable. But what happens when there's actually a price to this uh, implementation of fairness? And what happens when there's actually a price to this implementation of explainability? I think that's the interesting question. And when we and we look at fairness, I mean, uh, algorithms uh, elementally are used to discriminate. Their uh, sole purpose is to order people or to place them in specific bins. Um, so the algorithms we use, uh, we know there there's bias and we know there's discrimination. The question is, how can we correct or rebias this algorithm actually, um, so that it fits with what we think is uh, um, justifiable or what we think is is ethical? And uh, the fairness definitions you have there, I mean, that's an open discussion, and that's. I'm a bit uh, averse of the self-assessments and of those sort of lists. I mean, we did some trials with them, especially the European uh, self-assessment for ethical AI. And what you find is uh, that, um, well, first of all, they are assuming that all the AI applications have uh, equal ethical risk. Uh, and for example, just looking at the practical use case of the bank, uh, we have an AI that is uh, checking whether we should uh, reach out to someone via email or via a letter. Um, and when I started this ethical impact assessment with the data scientists developing that model, uh, the first question of the impact assessment was, did you perform a human rights impact assessment? And they were looking at me like, are you serious for, for type of model do we do we need to do an, an ethical uh, or a human rights impact assessment so there are different forms and different uh, different gravity of ethical risks and i think when it comes to fairness we we do check the high stake decision algorithms and you have the credit risk scoring which is the most obvious example for for every bank and uh, i mean it's an ongoing discussion it's a deliberative process where uh, actually you find that these values, these ethical values are are conflicting and we can say, well, we can say we want equal uh, equal parity, so to speak. We want to treat each group the same way, but that means that the accuracy for uh, the predictions of each group uh, are becoming less. So these are trade-offs that are uh, really difficult and we make them in a deliberative way and we revise them once we think uh, we didn't choose the right way. So it's an ongoing process and it's not statical and it's not a one size fits all. So it's not that we say we choose this definition of fairness uh, and then that will define what is fair for all the models we use. Uh, it's really context dependent and I think that's the most important part and that's uh, a bit of the, the trouble I'm having with all the, the frameworks out there. I mean, it's so context specific and um, um, I mean, the context matters so much that it's really difficult to get to a general interpretation of fairness, for example. So the best you can do is uh, motivate the decisions you make when it comes to fairness and signal that, for example, a credit risk scoring model will have an impact on uh, uh, different groups and on different subgroups differently. Um, but you cannot uh, come up with a one size fits all or a statical definition of fairness that will suit all your algorithms or that will stay with you in the long term. I mean, you have to monitor, revise and uh, deliberate about it. Thank you very much, Joris. That that's a very um, you know very detailed response. And and let me let me just dig a little bit deeper. What does it mean um, to have an explainable AI as an enterprise? Um, what what you know what does it mean in practice? The, this is one of the questions that appears in several formats um, throughout our um, um, for our our um, Slido application. Yeah, so what I, I can tell you what it means for us, and it means that we can uh, provide the explanation to each of the stakeholders that is relevant. Um, 
you will you want to have a different explanation for uh, consumers who don't want to be overloaded with all sort of information about models and statistics um, and so you want to have an explanation that's uh, tailored to their level of understanding so they know because they want to know uh, why is my application uh, approved or why uh, wasn't it approved that's the type of explanation they want and that differs significantly from the explanation you give to external oversight agencies for example so for us an explainable model means that we can explain the results and the outcomes uh, to the different stakeholders that we have to answer that's that's fine but would you agree that um when you were thinking about um explainable we're thinking about the way we build governance and you know the consideration that we um you know we have um at that level so should we start with thinking about the importance of explainable ai and ethics at a governance level and then have the real the sort of ethical controls as we build the products and i know maybe ashish and ilona you could you could um, you know step in and provide your views in this in this respect Sure. So one of the things, right, and, and privacy by design uh, by Anne Kavokian, who was the former uh, Canadian uh, privacy uh, governor, so or officer there, and she uh, she came up with the PBD concept uh, in the mid '90s, and it was just essentially to integrate privacy by design into the software development lifecycle, which is. Uh, you know, you're like, yes, that makes sense. But here we are, you know, almost 20 some odd years later, and we still haven't really gotten a lot of traction with that. Because I think that we have skipped through, you know, some of the people components of that, right? And this is where change management is so critical, and just educating people and, you know, simply having a basic conversation explaining what you're trying to do. And, you know, so it could be a variety of things, you know, just the the culture of an organization the communication within that organization as well what is the communication with your customers and just making sure that you level set are are on that same page but i think if you are a company and you do start out with good intentions that's really you know what matters and to have the ethics and that culture interjected throughout on a daily basis no matter what you do right technically it shouldn't just be by design it should just be by you know, by your own ethical procedures that you would do anyway. So I think that's the other thing we have to do is trying to get people in organizations in general and our value system within companies to have people just think about the impact of what you do on a daily basis. Thank you very much, Ilana. Um, Ashish, I don't know whether you're still with us. I would be very interested in, in getting your uh, viewpoint on, on that question. I think Ashish was disconnected just for a moment. So. Um, I, I just came back. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. <laughs> it no, threw me off. Uh, don't worry. I'm um, back. So I, did you manage to get a question? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I did. And I also, I thought, uh, Alona's uh, uh, response to it. So I'm going to just uh, uh, quickly say this, that we do have uh, in, in the Responsible AI uh, Office of Responsible AI business, uh, not business, but uh, the, the, the team that we have, we have uh, what we call an Aether committee, which is essentially, it's a, it's a committee with, with the uh, Responsible AI team, Microsoft Research and product teams. It's, and, and the basic idea there is uh, that we do responsible AI by design, right? So that Aether committee has a responsibility as a governance board across Microsoft on each and every product team has to actually go to them. In fact, I'll give you an example. So we, uh, my team actually produced this technology called authentication or video authenticator, which was for defect detection. And even it, if it was for defect detection, but the models, the technology models were trained on face, uh, facial uh, recognition technology, because you have to, for detection of face swap, you have to train the algorithm to figure out where the face is. So even the technology was for detection, but we had to go through a process of the, going through the Ether committee, getting an approval, and they have this checklist saying, okay, have you trained it for uh, like 
have you tested it for bias, right? What are the intentional harm? What are the unexpected harm, unintentional harm this technology may produce? Even though this technology for detection, which is not, but but still we had to go through. So I'm just making it a point that we are taking that step in the right direction. I don't think that we are there yet as a technology company, but I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be there soon where you have this, this ingrained, you know, responsible AI is not a, step on right it has to go from the sdlc from the basic design time till the process of deployment that that is that is fantastic thank you thank you very much Ashish. nikita you can you can come in yeah m my question that uh that is targeting um actually any one of the speakers uh to the term of responsible AI. I don't, I don't think that we are in the position of uh, assigning a responsibility to a machine. And my question uh, is who should be responsible? So if, for example, if uh, in the case of a technology company, there is a mistake, there is a, an error in the design or in the construction, in the development, in the deployment, or in the use of the system, who should be taken responsible and uh, so if, if for example we take ashish who is assigning this responsibility in your ethics team and to whom right who is who is going to who, who is going to answer if something will go wrong so I just pasted a link on, on responsible innovation uh, that we just recently published which we call a harms framework but nikita to your question as a technology company, the creators are responsible for it. So we, I think, are responsible and we are also, if if unintentional harms are created by it, and there is an example there, right, where we were, we were trying to acquire a, 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 a facial recognition company uh, and, and quickly re realized that it was uh, used by some governments to, uh, for for uh, recognizing faces and it, the bias was there in the technology and we took a step to not actually engage. Uh, we have also made some decisions which are very public on what we would do in terms of engaging with which governments and which which you know we will not, right? So again, we are responsible. I think we, we have to make sure that as a creators of technology, we not only are responsible while creating, but we are also responsible and take corrective actions when it is deployed and used as unintentionally uh, to create harm. Can I add an uh, answer? Um, because uh, we uh, have the same discussion of who should be responsible um, and we divide the question in who is responsible for the outcomes of an algorithm and who's responsible for the consequences of the outcome of an algorithm and basically the sole reason the project I'm doing now started was because the data scientists didn't feel comfortable with being uh, ultimately responsible for the ethical decisions they were making and um, uh, that's why uh, I came in actually at the bank is because they said well we shouldn't be the one even though we're the most knowledgeable we shouldn't be the ones taking this, these decisions, uh, we shouldn't decide what is fair and what is not fair, even though we do know the, the most about algorithms and about data, we shouldn't be the ones making these ethical decisions. So uh, with us, the data scientists are responsible as well. We have the model developer and the model owner. Ultimately, the model owner is responsible there and we all agree, but it shouldn't be the sole responsibility of the model owner to implement these ethical principles. And that's why we started the ethics office. That's why we started the ethics committee. Um, it is because we should support and provide guidance to model owners and model developers to make sure that the decisions they are making in relation to ethical principles and the ethical impact of their algorithms is backed up by the organization and that they have the support of the organization and not just have to fare on their own uh, gut feeling about what is fair and what is not fair. I would just wanted to add something here is actually that it has all uh, ethical framework, uh, you will probably already know about different frameworks out there, uh, from the ethics by design and by default, uh, from the design to development to implementation, and then to the usage of those um, uh, application. So um, within within each of the application, you probably would uh, want to define the user's needs first, and then uh, you would find out about data collection uh, and then the security of that 
methods and then the algorithm development of that and then the profiles or interference of that and then the impacts in users life so all of those you already have the framework out there if you follow that and if you can define those kind of different roles uh, for different teams because it's not going to be just only one team because in one bank we already know that it is not just only the, the data scientists who develop those uh, algorithm or those application but it is going to be involved with business people that will be uh, need to be involved and then the uh, the the owners of that uh, project for example so uh, it would be it's a learning process and we uh, can learn from other um, kind of um, industry uh, to actually apply it on this here and then uh, together with that we probably would see also the different kind of um, regulation will be introduce uh, gradually and by then we would also not just only relying or purely or heavily on ethical but we also um, relies on the compliance of all those regulations that are coming out as well so um, together uh, I think that we are evolving and uh, we are uh, learning uh, on the way and I think that um, we don't want to be all the time as the the American innovates and then uh, the China uh, the Chinese copies and then the European regulates. We don't want to be in that kind of monologue, but we wanted to see that what is the right balance. How are we going to strike it so that we can adopt and we can actually promote the. Uh, the usage of AI, not everything would need AI anyway, but like it, if we do and wanted to leverage the um, the positive impacts of AIs on um, on our peoples, on the market, in the on the economy, then we need to not only hold the grudge to something that is already kind of like um, our way of doing it. We need to be open and we need to be adopt as you already, um, many of the speaker already share. So I think that it's, it's, a, it's a journey, it's not a destination. That's why we are here. And that's why we are um, kind of trying to pull together uh, all of different thoughts. And I think that um, I appreciate and learn quite a bit uh, from our speaker today, as well as from the questions. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. Um, we have gone seven minutes over um, over our time, allocating time. Thank you very much, Ashish, Jar uh, Jaris, Ilona, um, Long, and Charlie. It has been an absolute pleasure, and thank you for covering so many of the questions. Um, and thank you, everyone attending or joining us and um, in, you know introducing your opinions in the discussion and asking questions. It's, it's just part of the dialogue. We have to continue doing this to get to a point where we're um, a lot clearer and, and have a sense of direction, uh, both on the investment side, on the uh, company side, regulation, and across the whole ecosystem. It's an exercise that we will have to continue to do, um, irrespective of how difficult it is. Um, Nikita, do you want to say a few last words? Yes, I... I want to say the words of appreciation for an amazing moderation of the session. I want to say thank you to all the speakers who uh, agreed to join us today and have this conversation. I want to say thank you to all of uh, those who attended and asked their questions. These questions are, uh, are a fuel. Uh, they are helping us to build the structures of our discussion. They help us to understand where, which are the problems that are not addressed. And specifically, I want to thank those people who were talking about black people involvement or female involvement in algorithm development. I want to add that we don't need to only talk about development, but also about the data collection and, uh, and how we how we label this data. So one of the projects that we're running in uh, in open ethics is about uh, assigning the metadata to those uh, to to those training data sets. So if you're interested in, in fighting 
uh, inviting problems with with bias, specifically racial bias or a gender bias or any other bias that is introduced throughout because of our historical uh, ways of making decisions. I want to invite you to well first explore uh, explore and learn a little bit about what we're doing. It's an open uh, source community and not a nonprofit, so. Uh, feel free to feel free to explore and uh, join us. Uh, the series is the educational piece that we're doing, uh, but on the back end, we're building uh, we're building a technology uh, that we can open and allow uh, developers give them uh, something in their hands so that they can disclose uh, how their apps are operating uh, and how to uh, how to. And, and to build this bridge of transparency between the end user or a consumer that will that will use the application and the company, the product. So uh, feel free to join. Uh, what I will do uh, the next week, I guess, I'm going to upload uh, the video from this session into our YouTube channel. So feel free to return to it. I will ask uh, all of our respected speakers and panelists today to upload their presentations and maybe some of the resources into a Discord. So you can always join Discord using this link. And in in uh, episode five channel, you will see you will see all the presentations in a in an hour or in a, in a couple of hours. So that's uh, that's the idea. Big big thank you for all of you. Uh, I had a I had a great learning session this evening, and uh, I, I, I hope all of you as well, please feel free to contact me either on LinkedIn or, or send me an email uh, open to this as well.